I'm Jim Bradford. I'm the dean at the Owen Graduate School of Management here on Vanderbilt's campus. And I um, share uh, a good deal in common, but as I've watched this evening progress a little bit, the, um, the knowledge that these men each have of each other uh, and, and the events surrounding uh, Senator Alexander's uh, work as he was governor and also as uh, these automotive ventures uh, came to Tennessee and their impact on Tennessee and greater Tennessee has been uh, miraculous. So I, I want to start this evening, if I could, and I'm going to start on my far right with Carlisle Carroll and ask if we could go across and if you would just do a little self-introduction about your background, kind of where you came from, uh, what you do, why you're here, and uh, so Carl, if you'll start us out. Yeah, Carlisle Carroll, I'm Vice President of Recruitment at the National Chamber. I've been in economic development work for about 25 years. I was just out of college and wet behind the ears when then Governor Mar Alexander was in office and you know, Senator Alexander, I hope to be able to tell some fun kind of behind the scenes stories that he probably doesn't even know that I know. So <laughs> yeah. no, I'm Guy Briggs and uh, I was uh, here in 1985 when I was chairman of the site selection committee for the Saturn program and uh, obviously we selected Tennessee and then uh, we built the plant and started it up but I was here from 1985 through 90, uh, start of 91, January 91 then I went back to GM uh, up uh, north and uh, came back here it was one of the plants I had when my last job when I was the group VP for assembly and, and metal fab and, and uh, labor relations. So I had Saturn again, so I got a great opportunity to return. So that's my connection and Lamar was governor <laughs> and I got a lot of great memories of that that I will share. My name's Bill Kruger. I'm the vice chairman of Nissan for the Americas. I have responsibility uh, here in the U.S. as well as across North and South America. And my history goes back further with this guy. Mr. Briggs uh, is one of my, I'll say, automotive and industrial heroes. Uh, I worked for General Motors back in 1985 when the guy came down here. So I've got a, a great history and a great respect, and it's actually a privilege to be between these two guys tonight. And I hope to share some of the growth that Nissan has, has been fortunate enough to be located here in Middle Tennessee, thanks to Senator Alexander and his efforts 30 plus years ago. So I'd like to help share some of the highlights of where we're at and where we're going here in Middle Tennessee as well. Senator. Um, I'm Lamar Alexander. I was lucky enough to be governor of Tennessee from 1979 to 1987, and somehow I found myself in the United States Senate 10 years ago, and I'm still there. <laughs> I, uh, I think it would only be appropriate uh, for, on behalf of Vanderbilt, to uh, thank uh, Governor Senator Alexander for the gift of his papers, uh, his gubernatorial papers, uh, to the Vanderbilt Library. and and a series of evenings and events that have been scheduled, some have already been held, some are still to come, uh, are about uh, the periods of time that he was governor, some of the things that happened during his administration, and also his impact on a go forward basis of what he's meant to Tennessee. Um, I think most of you know the story, but, but uh, Senator Alexander comes from a fairly modest beginning in Maryville, Tennessee. You want to tell us a little bit about your beginnings, Senator? Well, I, my, I grew up, uh, I'm, there are six generations of our family buried within about 20 miles of where I grew up in Maryville, Tennessee, and I went to high school there. My mother was uh, taught kindergarten and nursery school in a converted garage in our backyard. My dad was on the school board and worked at the Alcoa plant. He had been an element, uh, um, elementary school principal um, before he was Roy Kramer's elementary school principal, for some of you who are <laughs> Vanderbilt people, just to give you an idea of how things go. So, so I grew up there in, 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 in that small town, and I, I uh, 
My horizons, when I went to college, my horizons extended as far east as Duke and as far west as Vanderbilt, but not much beyond that. And I ended up here with a couple of scholarships, had a great experience, and went to New York University Law School. And since then, I've been in and out of government and politics, and the out includes helping to, with some other very talented, with some very talented people helping to found what has become now the largest worksite daycare company in the world called Bright Horizons. So uh, it's fun to come back and and uh, to Vanderbilt especially, but it's it's interesting to reflect on what has happened in Tennessee in the last 30 and 35 years and to imagine, especially in the Nashville area, how important uh, the arrival of the auto industry has been. So could maybe I begin there, Senator, with um, your, your, as your period of governorship began and kind of the inspiration or the thought of bringing uh, automotive uh, manufacturers, assembly plants, suppliers to, to Tennessee. Where did that inspiration come from and how did it begin? Well, and let, let me begin by just saying there's, uh, after when I was in my last year as governor, governor, Peter Jenkins took me to New York and I thought I wanted to write a book. And I went to some publishers and they said, what do you, what book do you want to write? And they said, well, maybe about the good things that happened while I was governor. And he said, that's really boring. He said, uh, <laughs> your mother might read it. And, uh, and what else are you going to do? And I said, well, nothing else. Uh, we're going to move to Australia for six months and live. He said, that might be interesting. <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about this tonight as if this were something that I did or, or what a great governor I was. I'm going to try to discuss it in terms of some stories. And I think these gentlemen will hear is as well, they're all really, really key, key individuals. The Nashville Area Chamber of Commerce did something that really wasn't done 30 years ago. It worked to bring the two biggest investments. General Motors investment was the, at that time, the largest investment, capital investment in the history of the United States in one plant. And the Japanese investment, Nissan, was the largest Japanese investment outside of Japan in one location and they worked to bring it to some county other than the one they were in, which was a very smart thing to do because it would have been wrong to try to put those two big plants in this county. But the enormous benefit to this county, they understood. And Guy was a part of a team that uh, uh, came down here and on their own found Saturn, really. Uh, that's the way General Motors did it. The, Nissan team was first Japanese and then it was a group of seven Ford executives who were frustrated by their inability in the structure of Detroit to be able to use their ingenuity and do what they wanted and they came down, started from scratch and, and built the plant. But my inspiration, um, I had no idea that this is what I'd be doing. My goal was to help raise family incomes. Now think back 30 years ago, we had, as, as President Carter came into office, we had uh, what President uh, Reagan would later refer to as the misery factor, but inflation was 12 or 14 percent, interest rates were 20 percent. I mean, unbelievable numbers. Nobody was investing in anything, and Tennessee was the third lowest in average family income. So my job as governor was to raise family incomes, but I didn't know how. Then I went to my first White House dinner. Governors go every February. I'm like my second month as governor. And President Carter said to the governors, governors go to Japan and persuade them to make here what they sell here. Then Japan was, you could substitute the word China for Japan. In turn, everything was Japan number one, Japan's gonna take us over, we'll never be able to compete with them, et cetera, et cetera. And they were selling everything Nissan, for example, makes, sold in the United States, it made in Japan or somewhere other than there. So no one had said to me walking across Tennessee, go to Japan after you get elected. Uh, in fact, the previous governor got in trouble taking the state plane you know, to the Bahamas or somewhere. So, but off I went and I remember uh, meeting with uh, Mr. Kawamata, who was the chairman, he was about 80, and Mr. Ishihara, who was the CEO, he was about 65, two big old gruff guys. And about halfway through the dinner, uh, Mr. Kawamata started laughing I, and through the interpreter I asked what are you laughing about and he said I'm about to make the biggest capital investment that our 
ever been made outside Japan in your state, and I'm twice as old as you are. <laughs> and what I realized was that in Japan, uh, uh, they, they think of as a governor in a hierarchical way. And so rather than have an office in Japan, we never had one. I just went a lot. And the one thing I'll conclude this question with is this is the most important map that in, in Tennessee's future. Uh, I said in 1979, and I think it is today as well. And I'll, I'll show you why. When I went to Japan, we knew nothing about them, and they knew very little about us. And so the question I often got was, where is Tennessee? So I took this photograph of the United States taken at night from a satellite. And I would hand it to them and say, look at that. You can see how big the country is, and everybody lives over here. That's where all the lights are. Nobody lives out there except some people in California. They've got their lights on. And some down in Texas, they've mostly gone to sleep, it looked like. But that's where all the people are. And where is Tennessee? It's right in the middle of the lights. And if you're making great big heavy things, the first thing you look at is the cost of transportation, or one big thing you look at. And beforehand, everybody was up here in the Midwest, and they stayed there because that's where the cars were invented. But nobody had really taken a fresh look at where the center of the United States was from a transportation point of view. And it had moved south since the cars had gotten started in the days of Henry Ford. And it was really Kentucky and Tennessee. And everything north of Tennessee did not have a right to work law, and we did. And we also gave a warm welcome, and we learned from Saturn as we went that you need to have a four lane, you, you need to have the best four lane highway system. Uh, that you could have because suppliers, and Guy may talk about that, they, they located their suppliers and their plants based upon the intersection of good four lane highways. Ours weren't very good, so we had three big road programs. But the inspiration came from President Carter. And I even called Dean Rusk down in Georgia and asked him to come up and talk to me, former Secretary of State, about how does one go about going to Japan? And then I spent more time in Japan over the next eight years than I did in Washington, D.C., and I always enjoyed saying with much more benefit to the people of Tennessee than if I had spent my time in, in Washington. So give President Carter a, a point, and I'll let the Nissan people tell you what percent of their products that they sell in the United States they make here and there. But then it was zero. And the last thing, one other point, if I may. At, at that time, there was almost no Japanese capital investment, Dean, and at a conference I was at in San, Francisco, in, in San Diego a couple of weeks ago, the estimate was there might have been three or 4,000 Americans working for Japanese companies then. By the mid-'80s, about half the Japanese companies in the United States were located in Tennessee, according to the J J Japanese ambassador, but we were so we were looking for Japanese companies, but the first one happened to be Otto, and that began to attract the attention of other people looking for the same, looking for the same thing. And so we've gone from having almost no auto jobs. We had a Ford glass plant, some others here 30 years ago, to, to auto jobs being one third of all the manufacturing jobs in Tennessee and, and companies like Nissan doing what President Carter asked them to do, which is to make in the United States what you sell in the United States. So if uh, I'm going to come back, uh, Bill, and, and have you bring Nissan forward, but I wanted to also uh, say something to, to Guy. And Guy, could you talk a little bit about, you, you were with GM, you were senior in management there, and you, uh, you were kind enough to bring Bill May with you tonight, so he's sitting in the audience with Saturn's operations here, but talk a little bit about about GM's decision to start this new idea of Saturn and, and how to make it happen somewhere outside the, the Detroit Metroplex. Well, yeah, thank you. I, I really, uh, I'll do a couple things here. I'll, I'll start with how the program started, the project started, and then also why we really came to Tennessee. And, uh, I think the, the, the project had started with a group of people with the goal in mind of competing with the Honda and Toyota vehicles at the time. <clears throat> because we were losing out in that part of the market 
And everybody had kind of thrown up their hands, could we make a vehicle that could compete here in the U.S. with the foreign imports that were uh, really eroding the share of the total U.S. market uh, from not only ourselves, but Ford and, and, uh, and the Chrysler, uh, the big three at the time. So we, the project developed a vehicle a candy apple red vehicle, and uh, they developed uh, a game plan culturally. UAW and uh, GM were tied together on it. Don Eakland and Al Warren really uh, started the, the project rolling, and it had the support of the chairman at the time, Roger Smith, who really wanted to see this uh, go. So. Uh, a bunch of us, uh, I say a bunch, about six of us, I think, came on board in January of 1985, and I happened to be uh, asked to chair the site selection committee. Where are you going to put this, this site that we're going to make a car that, once again, the primary aim, compete with Honda and Toyota vehicles at the time. And uh, so we did. Long story short, we had a lot of, because of all the publicity, which an operating guy like me, I, I really didn't care for, to be honest with you. But we had a lot of hoopla over where was the Saturn program gonna go? Where were they gonna make this vehicle? <clears throat> and we uh, met with a lot of governors, went to a lot of states, and uh, we did a lot of, uh, uh, study of conditions, not just where labor was necessarily, but we looked at all things, including K through 12 education. And the popular notion at the time, me included, because that's all I would hear from people that lived on the East Coast, and some of those who lived out on the West Coast in California was that the education systems there were far superior to you people in the Midwest and in the South, far superior. We found that not to be true. Some of the strongest K through 12 programs, kids in school, education-wise, were right. <clears throat> the state of Wisconsin was very good. Iowa was very good. Tennessee was very good. Tennessee was very good and had a lot to offer in that arena. So that played a role <clears throat> in what we, uh, and what we were about to do. And then uh, we, we met uh, Governor Alexander, and uh, I, I gotta say without embarrassing him, he was a big draw for us at General Motors. It was a big draw. Uh, just the way he reacted, uh, the way he responded to us, uh, there were a lot of good governors, certainly at the time, and we kind of boiled it down to the last three, and I can say this now, I think everybody was in second place back then. <laughs> you know, that's the politically correct way, I guess. But I'll tell you what it really was. We, in the Midwest, we looked at Wisconsin, where Bill and I had worked together before. We looked at uh, right north, Kentucky, and uh, Martha Lane Collins was governor there at the time. Mm -hmm. Very, very uh, great lady. And, uh, but, while we were doing this, we also wanted to know what the communities thought, and we hired some consultants <clears throat> to go out and, excuse me, into the community and find out how people shopping in the stores and walking the street, how they felt about this project, this Saturn, and what if it came to their community. And we found, to, uh, really, that there were some places that didn't, uh, the average citizen didn't really want us. And, uh, but here, the, the response was, was outstanding. And uh, we, we did, we, we were over in the eastern part of the state to begin with, as you recall, and couldn't find the, the site that uh, had, uh, well, they had just every site we looked at that was the size that we needed, the amount of acreage. They had a lot of owners, and that would make it much more difficult in, in getting site uh, purchased in that. So 
what we did is we ended up here, found this ideal spot down Spring Hill, Tennessee. <laughs> and the governor gave us a challenge. He said, I don't want you putting a big factory in there and disturbing the countryside and the way that Tennessee looks. And you got to really protect the environment. You got to protect what, the, what it looks like. <clears throat> and so I thought we did a pretty dang good job. And on July 29th, 1985, we got a picture. And it said on there, Welcome Home Saturn, July 29, 1985, from Lamar Alexander. And I have it where anybody that comes in the front door of my home up north, they can see it. And uh, there was a cobweb on a fence. And he said, I expect to see that cobweb there after you people are building your plant. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That cobweb's there. That's true. That cobweb is there. So that was the seriousness of it. And we, we just, uh, we also, uh, in the original construction site uh, preparation, we found a graveyard that was long buried and, and no one knew it was there, it had no markers. And we moved that across the street to Ripa Villa. For those of you who are familiar with Ripa Villa. And we re redid the, the graveyard. And uh, so we went a long way to try and satisfy, and, and we felt good about it. So that's kind of the history of why, how we got here. Um, we uh, had a partnership with the UAW through this, and uh, we, uh, in fact, Mike Heron is here, who's the chairman of the uh, UAW local in uh, Spring Hill, Tennessee, along with Bill May, and uh, we've gone through some rough times, but uh, it's uh, it's coming back strong, and I'll go into that a little later. But it. Uh, that was a great time, other than the amount of publicity. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're going to get more tonight, so yeah. you, you, <laughs> it's still coming. So, Bill, you want to talk a little bit about Nissan and kind of its origins here? Well, yeah, I think like Senator Alexander mentioned that when the Nissan plant really 32 years ago was deemed to come to Smyrna, there really was a a lack of global experience within Nissan Japan. And what they ended up doing was hiring some people with North American experience, with automotive experience, and they brought that team of seven individuals from Ford down here. Uh, Marvin Runyon was our original president and CEO of Nissan Motor Manufacturing and legendary within Ford, Nissan, and then went on to, to really make a name for himself with the TVA, as well as, as the Postmaster General. <coughs> I think he ruffled some feathers in Washington when he first took over the, the post office and decided that he didn't need to lose money <coughs> running the post office and kind of angered a number of people. But that's really the, the mentality that when Nissan came was to do something different. And there wasn't a lot of global uh, <coughs> oversight. There wasn't, uh, they really let the team develop the plant, hire the people, build the process, and now over 30 years later, <coughs> we're, we're approaching in the next year or two, we'll hit 10 million units produced out of the Smyrna site. 15 years ago, we added a engine facility down in Franklin County in uh, Deckard, Tennessee, and just this past year we started construction on a battery plant, a lithium ion battery plant, um, that will be making batteries for our all electric Nissan LEAF. So from an industrial standpoint, we have really strong footing here. When I joined the company almost seven years ago, it was decided shortly thereafter, I came down to, to run the Smyrna plant, 
that our headquarters in California, really the, the business environment there was not so healthy. The synergies that we had as a company were not so great. And it made sense at that time, and it still make, makes sense, is to relocate our headquarters here to Tennessee. We had a lot of confidence in the workforce. We had a lot of confidence in the relationship that we had and still have with the community, the, both the civic and the government leaders. So we relocated our sales and marketing headquarters, which is now our regional headquarters for now North and South America in Williamson County in Franklin, Tennessee. And today we've got over 10,000 Nissan employees here in Tennessee. We're uh, probably one of the largest plants that Nissan has globally in Smyrna. We've added over the years in the Deckard facility a lot more technology. We started out just assembling engines. We added casting, forging, and uh, this year we'll add electric motor manufacturing to Decker, Tennessee. And just about each one of those are first outside of Japan for Nissan. And they have confidence, very strong confidence in our global headquarters for the workforce here in Tennessee. And that's why we've been kind of the leader when something new was moving out of Japan to bring it here to Tennessee. It really was the workforce, the education of the people, the friendly, friendliness of the people. <coughs> a couple weeks ago, I had the opportunity to host a plant tour, a gentleman by the name of Mike Jackson. He's the CEO of Auto Nation, which is one of the biggest auto dealers. <coughs> They've got a couple hundred dealerships in the US. We took him on a plant tour of Smyrna. And he said it was the, he's traveled around the world, he used to work for Mercedes, he's been in hundreds of plants in dozens of countries. And he said Smyrna, which was his first visit a couple weeks ago, said it was the first plant that he's gone to that the workforce was extremely busy, but they had time to wave and say hello as he was going through the plant. And we said some of the plants that he's been in, they waved, but they didn't have all five fingers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> he said, he said he was really <laughs> thrilled and he could tell why we're able to build a quality and efficient product in Smyrna. So that's, that's where we're at right now. So I wanted to go back to, uh, to reach back and then reach forward a little bit as kind of we move into a theme of current and future. But, but uh, Senator, you told a story about, the, about a call uh, or a visit perhaps uh, with regard to Toyota. In, in about, I think, the day or two after Saturn was announced. And uh, can you tell us that story? Yeah, that, that's sort of the story of the one that got away. But um, it would be hard to exaggerate the amount of attention that, that the, the Nissan plant, and then even more, the Saturn plant received. Uh, I mean, you had governors making literal fools of themselves, uh, <laughs> you know, going on the Phil Donahue show. And, and uh, um, it's hard to know exactly what to do. I, I, I saw something that said that the Saturn brand, before it ever built a car, was better known than the Pontiac brand, which had been selling cars for 60 years. That's because of all the hype mm -hmm. over, over the car. Mm -hmm. And so it, its arrival was more than just an assembly plant or even all the suppliers that came. We haven't talked about supply. I'm sure we'll talk about suppliers. We're going to talk about suppliers yeah. after a while, but it, it was a good housekeeping seal of approval on Tennessee as a place to cr to create jobs. And I took almost the entire state's advertising budget and bought a full page ad in the in the Wall Street Journal, which I wrote, which it said Saturn finally found a home in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and told told all all the all the reasons why. Now at the same time, Toyota, of course, who was bigger than Nissan, uh, wanted to, uh, was looking for a place to put its first big manufacturing plant. And I had been trying to see Dr. Toyoda for about four years, but I hadn't been able to get into seeing him. And on the day that Saturn announced that they were coming to Tennessee in 1985, 
I got a call that I could see, the Dr. Toyota would see me. So we participated in all that. I got on a plane, flew to Toyota, to, to Japan, to Toyota City, and I was trying to think of what, what to say to him. Because having Nissan was a tremendous advantage, but, some, but to, to expect its you know, principal competitors to come is, you gotta think about that a little bit. For example, in the General Motors case, what I finally said to Mr. Smith, Roger mm -hmm. Smith, yes. and I don't know whether it made any difference to him or not, I said, Mr. Smith, why don't you put your plant right down next to the Nissan plant that's making the cars, the kind of cars you're trying to beat, and tell your management and tell your union, if they can do it, you can do it. Now, whether he heard that, I don't know, but that's <laughs> what he did. That's what he did. I mean, he put his plant right next to his competition. He sort of, instead of competing at the, you know, at, at the dealer, they were competing there. Well, what do you say to Toyota when it's, you know, Toyota and Nissan in the same room is like having two roosters in the same barnyard or Alabama and Auburn in the same yeah. game. You know, that, that's a very, that, that's, that was difficult. Or Kentucky and Vanderbilt. Kentucky right? and <laughs> Vanderbilt, uh, yeah, to, to this week. But to, to, to make a short story of it, uh, to shorten it up, um, I concocted this idea. One of the things I noticed about Japan was it's a lot like Tennessee. I mean, if you draw a circle around Japan, uh, around the world, it goes through Nashville and Tokyo pretty much. And so the rhododendrons bloom at about the same time in the maple trees, and they have black bears, and they have mountains and this and all that. And this book is a book that we did just to show the simil how similar these dissimilar places were. And, and so one thing, both Tennessee, and, uh, I figured that we couldn't possibly get Toyota to come to Middle Tennessee, where Nissan already was. And so one thing that both <laughs> Tennessee and Japan have are black bears. So, and you know, black bears have territories. So I concocted this whole approach of, uh, and I had it all written up, and I went to see Dr. Toyota, and I said, uh, you know, Dr. Toyota, and I had all the, in Japan, when you're meeting with him, he's in the center, and everybody's down the, down the row, and only the guy in the center speaks. I said, Dr. Toyota, uh, in Tennessee, is in Japan, we both have black bears, uh, so, and I guess he's wondering, what's he talking about? And um, I said, now, in Nissan's already has its territory. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, and I said, but we have a great big territory over here in the eastern part of, the, of Tennessee that's a long way from Nissan, and we've got some really nice sites over there. So these were some of the same sites that, that Saturn had looked mm -hmm. at. Uh, and it, over there, it's hard to find uh, enough flat land that you can buy. You can't condemn this land. People have to voluntarily sell it. We could talk about that too. Later. <laughs> but but uh, so we worked really hard to get to East Tennessee, and they went to Kentucky. I think part of the reason was I think the Japanese manufacturers at that time were were to, to were, were distributing their plants in different states to maximize their political influence. I mean, I just let's just be straight about it. I think that was true, and and so that put. Toyota in Lexington, which is not far from East Tennessee. Plus, we didn't have just the right site. Plus, Nissan was already here. And about four months later, I received a visit at a governor's conference in Virginia from a senior Toyota executive who came to see me and apologized for not locating the plant in Tennessee. And he said, but we have a small something we want to tell you. We want to locate a small plant in your hometown, which is Maryville. And so they located a plant Nippon Denso, which is a tier one supplier to many auto companies, 100 employees. Today it has about 4,000 employees in Maryville and one other city in East Tennessee. So the consolation prize for not getting, for the one that got away, was probably the largest and one of the most successful auto suppliers in, uh, in anywhere in the southeast. So the suppliers are really an even more important part of the story than the location of the big assembly plants. So Carlisle, you brought a map, and I wanted to get you to show us a map and talk a little bit about the impact of the supply chain back into uh, this part of the world. And, and while he's unfolding that, I had the good privilege of, in a former life, of supplying uh, Honda and Toyota and 
General Motors and Ford and a few other folks with a, with a, a plant located in, uh, several plants located in the southeast, including uh, down uh, near your hometown, uh, Governor, uh, over, in, over in Sweetwater. And uh, if anybody knows where Sweetwater at Tennessee is, <laughs> a couple of you. And uh, that's exactly right. <laughs> But anyway, Carlisle, tell us I, about the splash. I actually tried to get the Coors beer plant in Sweetwater, saying that was the uh, closest thing they could come to gold in Colorado, but, I, <laughs> but they went to Virginia instead. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Sweetwater. I'll just preface that just by a couple of stories that, that happened during that time. And what you might want to remember is, you know, 30, 35 years ago, we didn't have the international community that we do now here, and there was a little bit of a fallover from the previous war where some of the international folks maybe weren't quite as welcome as maybe some of the domestic folks were at that time. So what I'm, the point I want to make is it is very unusual for governor to go out of the box and start this Japanese um, marketing plan when nobody else was doing it. It's almost like, you know, being in East Nashville now is a cool thing to do. It used to not be a cool thing to do, but he did it before it was cool and started uh, working with those folks. At the same time, right after that, with Saturn, you know, he mentioned that he went to them and said, do you want to be competitive? Do you want to be equal to them on the same ground? A totally different marketing idea than anybody else would have said, but it ended up working. So two, two great ideas that came about. And then I think he'll talk a little bit about this later, but to pull the land together for Nissan, there was a real fun story that happened. I won't, I won't tell that story for him, but we want to make sure we go back to that story. Um, and then just to kind of give you some numbers, you can see a little bit from this map, and I'll make sure that I leave it up. But uh, this is just sort of a, a two to 300 mile radius around Tennessee. The little dots are the automotive suppliers, and the, the big dots you can see, obviously, the logos that are there with Ford and Toyota and Nissan and different folks. They all started back when Nissan really, really came into this marketplace. And the numbers are that out of the 95 counties in Tennessee, 88 of them have some type of automotive supplier. 95 counties, 88 counties have suppliers. And then there's a $6 billion payroll in the state of Tennessee, which has paid for a lot of homes, a lot of clothes on back, a lot of foods in mouth. And again, we'd, we'd be remiss to say also paid for a lot of college education. So thanks in, in large part to what Governor Alexander did, um, we, we've reaped the benefits of that. So let's go back to the uh, Nissan land. Uh, let's tell that story a little bit. And uh, Bill and, and Governor, you want to you add a little color here about uh, finding the right land for Nissan? Well, let me tell my version of it and see if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> my sense of it, Nissan and, and, and Saturn approach this entirely different way. Saturn found its own land. Right, guy. I right. mean, you. Nobody knew what uh, what. Uh, I mean, people would say to me, Peter Jenkins, who lives in Spring Hill, said, "I read in the paper that this could there's nothing to this." Is there? You know, the next day was the announcement. So Saturn <laughs> found its own land, but but but, Mr. Ishihara, who was the CEO of Nissan, and as Bill said, uh, it's not an insult to the Jap the Japanese were very naive at that time about diplomatic relations. They were very sophisticated in selling what they made around the world, but, but very uncomfortable with dealing with the rest of the world. And it was like tiptoeing into a completely different environment. And, and this, was, this was not that long after World War II. I mean, there was a proposal to name the, the, the road out to, to, uh, to the Nissan plant, the Pearl Harbor Highway, you know, by, by some <coughs> local citizens. So the, the, we had a lot of, the, there was a lot of worry about, uh, 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 about that. So Mr. Ishihara, who was the chief executive officer, was intensely involved in every detail of what they did. And he knew the depth of the rock in Dixon County and was surprised I didn't know it uh, when he would talk. So he came to me and said, we want these 400 acres, and it was in Rutherford County. And I said, well, Mr. Ishihara, we don't own those 400 acres. Those, I found out, belong to Mr. and Mrs. McClary. He said, well, those are the ones we have to have or we will go somewhere else. So, well, 
So I drove down to Rutherford County one night and sat out on the porch with Mr. and Mrs. McClary, who was in their 70s, and they had no interest in selling. They were happy, I mean, they were at a point in their life where they wanted to live their life on their farm and, you know, die there. But they persuaded them how important it was to Tennessee, and they agreed to do it. Then Mr. Ishar came back and said, 400 acres is not enough. We want the adjacent 400 acres. <laughs> that was owned by Mamie Cantrell in Hickman County. And so I went down to Hickman County and I had lunch with Mamie Cantrell and she served key lime pie. And I said, Mamie, uh, we need for Nissan to be able to buy your 400 acres. I can't sell it. I said, why? She said, because my tenant farmer lives there and I promised him that he could live there and work that farm the rest of his life and I'm a woman of my word. Okay, so we thought for a while and I got Boyce Magley in Williamson County and whom I knew and I said, Boyce, we need to find a 400 acre farm in Williamson County that's about exactly like Mamie Cantrell's farm in Rutherford County and he did and, 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 and we worked out a swap where I guess Nissan uh, bought that 400 acres and swapped it with Mamie for her 400 acres. And she felt like she was able to keep her commitment to her farmer because he could work on an identical farm one county away. And that's how Nissan got all 800 acres. But it was a difficult process and I wasn't sure for a long time whether it would happen. And Mamie's nope. still there. You can go <laughs> ask her about it. Yeah, that is a lot different. Though. Yeah. I mean, you would yeah. never have done anything yeah. that way. So before we kind of move to the, to the final part of this uh, future, we've got a, another 15 minutes or so. We've got lots of celebrities in the audience, a lot of people who uh, played a role in this, uh, had a hand in what happened, remember stories. And I just wanted to invite, we've got a microphone up here if anybody wants to step up and, and have a have a question or ask, a, tell a story, or anybody got to want to do that? Any questions from the audience? I'll see if I can coach you a little long, a little one more time here before the evening's out. I want to talk about the future, and uh, we've we've heard about kind of what what's going on. Um, in how you got here and what this difference has made in, in, in the vision. Um, and I, I'm gonna go back in the history. I always think to, to predict the future, you always have to know the history. And so there's, a, there's an interview, Senator, that you may not remember, but it was with Jane Pauley. And you were debating whether it was yeah, wrong. I, I, I was on there with, Jay, with Chet Atkins, I think, at the World's Fair, and they, had, they asked him about world affairs. They had me play the piano, which I thought was ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. But the, the question was, you were debating, and I can't remember who the economist or who, who the debater was, but debating about whether it made any sense at all for, uh, for for the governor of Tennessee to encourage the location of automotive plants and from, uh, from various parts of the world into the state uh, when uh, one might say that there was some Im export restrictions uh, going into Japan and did that, you know, was, was, that, was that the right economic move? And you talked about, about uh, President Carter and, and his words, words of instruction, but do you remember that, that debate a little bit? Yeah, I do. I do, and it was a good point. And he, the point was that it's it, they're they're not fair that they have all these rules. They they can sell here, but we can't sell there. That's and right. So why should we put up with that? Well, we shouldn't. And it's still very difficult to sell into Japan. <laughs> it still is. I mean, it, but 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 President Carter, I think, was right. And and the United Auto Workers. Remember, this was not a Republican president. This was a president trying to figure out how he's going to deal with this job loss, and he, I think, correctly said, well, at least we can get people who are going to make, going to sell things in this big country to make them here as much as possible and create an environment in which they can make money doing, doing that. So I remember the debate, and, and I th think it's relevant today looking ahead, if that's what you're yes. beginning to do, Dean. And, and I was at a conference on China uh, in San Diego about three weeks ago, and, and as I mentioned, and this is what they said, they, 
I mean, the, the, you, you could almost substitute the word China for Japan 30 years ago. And, the, and so the question for me is, will 30 years from now, China be selling in the United States more of what they, uh, will they be making in the United States more of what they sell in the United States? Now, they're two different countries. There are many differences. But uh, China's economy is probably going to be the biggest in the world by 2022. It's a lot of money. And if they have all that money, they're going to want to get in this market because this market is still going to be as big as theirs. And maybe they don't do as well as they think they're going to do over the next 10 years. Japan didn't. And, and we may continue to be bigger. So everybody who's going to want to sell here may want to make things here. And if you add up the, the, the things that, that make more sense, if transportation was important 32 years ago, it's even more important today. It's more expensive today so 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 you come here um, uh, currency is a big factor guy was telling me uh, General Motors is making uh, 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 and and Nissan both are making vehicles and parts that they sell in South Korea and Japan and around the, around the world Cur currency is a big the labor costs in Japan now are are not the major difference between labor costs in the United States that they once were. They still are in China, but they're not today in, in Japan. And then the Fukushima uh, episode reminds us that if you want just-in-time delivery and big four lane, and good four-lane highways are important, then why would you be creating a part in some other part of the world and sending it to a supply, you know, a, 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 an assembly plant in, in the United States? So I, I think that uh, there's, a, It'd be, it'd be fun to be governor today and be thinking about if I were going to invest all that time and attention into a single objective, mm -hmm. and sometimes putting all your eggs into one basket is the right strategy if it's the, if it's the right basket. And a state only has very limited ability, and these countries are so big, but I wonder what country would be the right target for Tennessee looking ahead the next 30 years. Is it South Korea? Is it China? Is it some other place to think about, can we create a, 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 a place? Uh, my, my last statistic is that I'm, I'm told that the number of Americans working for Japanese companies, to, I mean for Chinese companies today in the United States is about 4,000. And it's about the same, about that same number were working for Japanese companies 30 years ago. And if it's true, as I was told at the San Diego conference, that there are now 800,000 Americans working for Japanese companies, how many Americans will be working for Chinese companies in 30, 35 years in the United States? And do we want, do we want that to happen? If we do, we ought to think about it and think of it as a source of good jobs and family incomes for, for, for our state. Bill, you've got responsibility for the Americas now, and I know you're building operations uh, and expanding your Tennessee operations, which I think is most admirable, but you're also doing that in some other places where you're close to the market. Uh, could you just talk a little bit about the future as you see it of, of having resources close to the markets you serve, supply chains, and, and how, how Nissan views that? Yeah, I think definitely there's a, there's a shift to more localization and localization for some of the, the um, reasons that Senator Alexander talked about is having a supply chain that is very distant. Uh, it's, it's very uh, high risk to volatility and both political volatility, economic volatility, exchange rates, or uh, what we experienced almost a, a year ago this week was a you know, horrific earthquake and tsunami in Japan. And right. uh, as a matter of fact, during the, the months that followed the earthquake and, and tsunami, we were shipping engine blocks from Decker, Tennessee to Japan to help support their recovery. And we continue to do that for about six months. Um, but we're building a new plant down in Brazil. Uh, we're building a brand new plant in Mexico. Those have I think received a lot of publicity and press, and I think it was it was good for those countries. It's good for those communities. It helps build the brand there. But the fact of the matter is, we're going to add more employment here in Tennessee and Mississippi, where we've got an additional assembly plant. 
and invest more capital in Tennessee between Deckard, we're gonna build a new engine plant there that we're gonna have a partnership with Daimler and produce engines jointly between the Japanese, the, the Germans, and you know the Americans are gonna be making them, the, the uh, Germans are gonna be designing them, and the, the Japanese are gonna help support the, the process. So there's quite a bit of international uh, you know, overlaps and cooperation and collaboration that you wouldn't have seen. And I think you know, in, in that's where automotive is going with more partnerships to cover some of the, the huge fixed costs. But for us here in the US, um, next in two months, we're gonna launch a brand new Altima sedan, which is our number one uh, selling vehicle. It was not the second highest selling automobile car in the US last year. 98% of those parts and components will come from North America. Very, very small fraction will be coming from Japan. So we're seeing a lot more localization and the competitiveness of the workforce. I think like Senator Alexander alluded to, you know, maybe the wages are a little bit disparate among some countries, but when you take in a lot of the other social costs, there's and, and then the length of the supply chain and the cost to deliver large parts, we're extremely competitive here right. in Tennessee and in the US. Would, wouldn't say we're a low cost country, but we're an extremely competitive country. And, and I'll say the fact that, you know, Saturn is bringing more volume back and, and hiring more jobs, um, we're thrilled about it. it. It will help us attract and bring back some suppliers that shrunk and that we lost. And there's quite a bit of synergies now that we do have these four lane interstates and we have a lot of suppliers that are located close to us. And we could see from Carlisle's map, we're in the center of gravity. We were the kind of the Southern tip that in some cases it didn't make sense to build a plant down in middle Tennessee in the case we have now with Kia, Hyundai, Toyota, number of people to the south of us, we're right in the heart. Right. It, uh, I, I won't elaborate on this, but I know that during the, the period of following the tsunami and the downturn and, and what was going on, uh, one of the interesting things that you saw automotive suppliers doing is very interested in their supply chains. And, and so much so that, that it, as, as General Motors was struggling a little bit and as Ford was struggling a little bit and Chrysler was struggling a little bit, it was very important to maintain your supply chains even for localization because they all supplied so many of the same things. Guy, you, you got a chance to walk back through Saturn's plant. Yeah. You, got to, you got to see what's coming back and I think you've got to be excited about that. Uh, the decision was right to locate here uh, can you talk a little bit about your view of the future for Saturn here? Well, yeah, I was uh, really excited today to be able to go back. I hadn't been here in six years and uh, to see what's transpired at Spring Hill. And they, they put uh, $800 million into that operation in the last uh, year and a half and uh, making engines uh, that are being shipped to five different countries. Uh, so the, the powertrain part of the business has really expanded. We're still doing sheet metal uh, and shipping sheet metal. They're, they're doing uh, uh, the uh, polymers uh, uh, in the DIS operation. And uh, of course, they've got the Equinox, which has uh, been uh, announced that's coming in. And they're looking down the road at more vehicles. And so I think the commitment uh, here after some very rough times, no doubt about it, through the bankruptcy, and, and, and you all know that. Uh, we, we had uh, the uh, vehicle down here, the uh, Chevrolet vehicle uh, that was started up, uh, I know in, uh, I think, uh, 07, I forget now the exact year, it was after I retired, I know that, but we had it on the books. And of course, uh, did not produce that very long because of the, the problems that transpired. And so uh, now there's a hot selling Equinox here and uh, more to come, more to come. So the commitment's there and, and, and it's been a great place to be. You, you people are really to be congratulated for the type of culture 
and the type of atmosphere that's here for a business. So that's the softer side of it, but also the centrally from a supply standpoint, and, and Phil's right on. You know, it, and, and Lamar mentioned it earlier too. We just, it's moved, it's moved. And Tennessee, what, what better place to be, right? Thank you. Carlisle, it wouldn't be, the evening wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about Volkswagen. And, uh, and Volkswagen coming to Chattanooga and just, can you just say a few words about that? Yeah, just a little bit, and a lot of you folks have probably read the stories, but it was kind of the part of the state that maybe hadn't benefited from one of the big relocations and had maybe come in second a lot of times to some different projects over the years and really worked hard. Claude Ramsey down there, he was the county mayor uh, the city mayor, some of the economic development officials, and then uh, the previous governor, Bredesen, and now uh, Governor Haslam on this. Uh, another large plant, billion dollar investment, a couple thousand employees, 1,300 acres put together, um, a great project for Tennessee, but southeastern part of the state. And then right behind that, you see suppliers coming and then just this week, we're meeting with some additional suppliers that are actually supplying that facility to look at some additional things that may be happening in Tennessee. So to be introduced to folks, not just in Japan and Michigan, but in Germany too, that are doing great things here, they're hiring a lot of folks. Uh, it's been, been a good history and I think a, a good future uh, for Tennessee that's coming about, not just in the automotive industry, but in a lot of def different target areas as well. So one of my jobs is to conclude us on time tonight, and I'm going to ask if you, if uh, each of you would take just a minute or two to kind of maybe a concluding remark, and I'm going to start with you, Senator. Well, I, I, it's a, I want to thank Vanderbilt and uh, Dean Bradford and Dean Dowell and for for doing this, uh, and. My, this is fascinating for me to not just to look back 32 years, but look ahead 30 years and see what there is to learn. And one one thing I should emphasize: the, these companies make their own business decisions. I mean, governors don't tell General Motors where to put its plant, or or, or Nissan, or Volkswagen, or anybody else. But they do, but they do look for an environment in which they can make a profit. And make a good, a, a good, a good car, and or truck, and or or supplier. And one of the things that's helped us over those 32 years it, is have been a succession of bipartisan work, and uh, by a series of governors of both parties. We've really alternated Republican Democrat, Republican Democrat during that whole period of time, and the business executives who were investing. Now remember. Nissan was the big, I, don't, I want to emphasize that. I mean, General Motors put more money here than anybody ever had anywhere in a capital investment. And Nissan put more than anybody had outside Japan. So they, they wanted to be careful about what they put it. And they were as interested in who the next governor is as who the present governor is. And what the legislature's attitude as well as the governor. And to their great credit, the Governor McWhorter and, and Governor Sundquist and Governor Bredesen, Governor Haslam have made these handoffs uh, with the legislative cooperation in a seamless way. I mean, I've been in many meetings where Governor Sundquist was handing to Governor Bredesen the discussion about the Nissan headquarters, for example, and nobody, I mean, there wasn't a political word discussed. So that, that would be something that particularly in this day and time when it sounds like people in public life don't work together, it's a pretty good example of how they have and the payoff's been big. Thank you. Bill? Yeah, I'd just like to echo that, that, that definitely the collaboration and relationship that Nissan has had both with the community leaders as well as the, the government has been seamless as we've added and expanded and grown the, the business. Uh, the thing that I can't emphasize enough though, and, and this goes back to my years with General Motors as well, is that and I'm sure Mike and Bill can, can add to this, is that a lot of people transfer into Middle Tennessee, but there's not many that want to transfer back out. Uh, and a lot of it has to do with the, the lifestyle, the community, the, the schools. The, it's just a great place. I've got four kids in school in, all around town here and uh, just thrilled to be here. And I think regardless if it's Jap Jap or Chinese or Africans or whoever else is coming, 
Nissan's going to be here 32 years from now, and, and I won't be in charge, but I think uh, we're in good hands here in Middle Tennessee. Thank you. Guy? Yeah, I, I echo everything that's been said, and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, Saturn's uh, commitment here, and, and we, we've got uh, people coming back. I have everybody, they tell me today, that is laid off uh, will be back. And uh, so that's great news. And then we're going to add jobs. And then that's great news. So you'll see the employment rise at Saturn. And it's uh, really, uh, once again, uh, the, the location, the people, the leadership here. And I know a lot of people that in the audience here that I've worked with for uh, a long time down here. And even after I left. And, and the beauty of it is, an old guy like me, I'm retired. Okay, but I still hear from people here from Middle Tennessee, huh. and so I, that, I really uh, that's very much appreciated. So I think with a young guy like Bill <laughs> here running this on, and we got Bill May, and Mike out there uh, at Saturn, you're in good hands. Thank you, Carl. Yeah, I'll just finish up with a personal story. Uh, I think it was 1982. My mother, who's now 86 years old, bought a Nissan truck. And she still has that Nissan truck. Body's in perfect shape. Did not have air conditioning. Didn't have a radio. Five-speed manual transition. And all the sons and the son-in-laws are fighting for that truck every year. <laughs> She's still holding on tight to it. But I, I, think it I got my too. mom a new Murano last year, so it's time, Carlisle, to step up and time, time to buy your mom a new car. <laughs> okay. We'll, we'll look at the models this year. Anyway. So, so on behalf of Vanderbilt University and on and behalf of Dean Dow and myself, I want to thank each of you for being here tonight. I think we're greatly privileged to have the kind of uh, both corporate and, uh, and, and governmental leadership we have. And um, these are great examples of why this is a great place to be, a great place to live. So thanks for being here tonight. And please uh, thank our guests who have uh, shared their evening with us. Yeah. 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 I thought Michigan was the